Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number 329 of The Freelancer Show. This week on our panel, we have Eric Dietrich. Hey, everyone. And Jeremy Green. Hello. And I'm Ruben Lerner. And this week, we are going to talk about career development for freelancers. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. I assume, I, I, I seem to remember like you guys had uh, as it were, real jobs before you started freelancing. I certainly did. And certainly in my training, I deal a lot with companies wanting to help their employees improve. And so this whole idea of career development while you're a full-time employee is very obvious. Um, but like then if you want to um, do it as a freelancer, things get a little more complex. So we're going to try to talk this week about things you can do and things you should do for yourself as a freelancer to improve your business skills, improve your technical skills, and make sure you're always on that cutting edge so you can offer good things to your clients. So um, you guys have any any starting advice, suggestions for what people can or should do? Or maybe let's, so, let's, you know, let's even go back for a second. What sorts of, like, let, let's even ask like the super basic question, which is why should you be improving like your career skills? And then what sorts of skills should you be working on? And then we can deal with the, the how. So I think for the why of it, it's because, um, well, so not to get mushy or what have you, but there's um, a strong motivator, I think, kind of intrinsically, like the whole concept of mastery, autonomy, purpose. And so I think it's kind of easy to get caught into a, a series of like tasks that you regularly execute or something and feel that you're kind of in a dead end. So like there's an element of mastery and satisfaction, I think, to um, this idea of career development and, and thinking that you're you're going somewhere, that there's a, a broader purpose, I guess, to what you're doing. So I think that's an underratedly important part of the why. But, I, it, you know, it's also going to help you uh, be better as a solo consultant or business owner, uh, whatever it is you're doing. Um, I think because there's a different set of skills required to improve your business than maybe to deliver the craft that's at the core of your business. Uh, so that's my take, I guess, on why. Yeah, I'd agree with a lot of that why. And I think that kind of also leads into, uh, you know, if you're trying to be a a consultant or a freelancer, you know, people are paying you to have deep skills that they don't have and that are hard to cultivate. And so having those skills and making sure that your skills are up to date helps you kind of, you know, stay on the leading edge and be able to charge rates uh, accordingly. Yeah. I mean, you, if, if you want to come in as the expert, uh, expertise is always uh, a moving target, especially in technology stuff. And so if you were an expert 10 years ago and you haven't done anything to update your technical skills, then you're almost certainly not an expert anymore. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I also agree that like the business skills are very important, not necessarily because the business stuff is changing, although it is to some degree, but you could just never learn enough. I mean, and we'll talk about this more, but like I've, I've been learning so much about marketing and sales and all sorts of other stuff that just never occurred to me when I was you know, studying programming and computer science. But I think there's also like a, a personal satisfaction thing. Many of us are freelancers, not only because we can have you know better income than as full-time employees, but there's a sense of I am controlling my destiny. I am uh, having a, a sort of better life and I'm able to do really cool, interesting stuff. And part of that cool, interesting stuff is always learning new things and be able to do new things. And so if I don't learn new things all the time, I feel like I'm missing out on one of the great benefits of being a freelancer. 
So I, I, I love the fact that I'm constantly learning new stuff. And if I didn't get a chance to do that, I'd, I'd be pretty annoyed. Um, so with that out of the way, like, so what, what should, what should be give, maybe uh, you guys can like give some examples of what should people learn or what are things that you've learned? <laughs> what are things that you've learned you've learned that you wish you had learned before? I don't know if that's too many levels of meta. <laughs> um, so things that I've learned that are career development since going off on my own. Um, I think for me, the biggest one that's maybe, you know, pretty general, but a good place to start is um, I come from a software development background. And so the first thing I started doing when I was on my own was kind of a mix of application development, coaching and training, um, these types of activities before I started to get more and more specialized. And I think that in the beginning, I thought that um, just kind of doing those, like my core skill set there was enough. And I underrated for a while the importance of other business activities like uh, marketing, finance, sales, those types of things. Um, so I think the biggest, I guess, w when I related to career development, the thing that was most important for me going off on my own was to start to become well-rounded enough that I could speak intelligently about those other disciplines of the business and execute them for my own uh, sake. Uh, so I think that was a big one. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, I think the biggest changes that I've seen in my business have really been around learning those other things that are outside of my core competency and taking them seriously and, you know, treating them with the same uh, level of respect and importance as my core competency because, you know, being a freelancer, uh, you don't just get to focus on the thing that you do. You have to focus on all the other business uh, aspects. Uh, and if you let those uh, lag, you know, that can be really bad for your business. Yeah, we're always talking about, and, you know, for a long time, Philip, when he was on the show, would talk about, um, you know, specializing and niching down and everything. And I, I mean, I always say, I, when I started off doing my work uh, as a freelancer, I was so proud of the fact that I was not specializing. And the thing is, not only does specialization go very deep and allow you to charge more and be an expert and so on and so forth, but it frees your time up to go study these other things which are necessary. If you're always chasing after every new library, every new language, I mean, that's an impossible task in and of itself. But then you don't have time to study the marketing stuff and the sales stuff. And so, I mean, right, the, the business stuff is, I would say, even more important than the technology things. Yes, you have to be an expert in technology, but if you're not an amazing expert in technology, but you are amazing at communicating and you do know how to talk to people and you do know how to um, sell, then you'll do great. You really, really will do great. So let me actually, let, a, let's, oh, sorry, sir. I was going to say as a freelancer, developing the ability to understand the need for that balance, I guess, um, and kind of having a check on yourself not to go chasing the latest frameworks just for the sake of doing so is so critical because, um, I spent a lot of years in the corporate world, um, some of those in management. And one of the things that happens there is there's kind of a natural government. The career development isn't just you in a vacuum, obviously. It's, you know, the person you report to. And typically there's a template for um, doing uh, career evaluation, performance reviews, that type of thing. And so there's a natural governor on, hey, you know, maybe you're going off chasing too many frameworks. You should think about where you want your career going with this company, um, maybe other skills you should develop. So there's typically people there that are kind of reining you in and, and trying to steer you. You have external input um, as far as you're concerned. But when you go off on your own, there's nobody to stop you from kind of going way into the weeds and never coming out. So the ability to, uh, I guess, kind of step outside yourself a little and look at what you're doing is so critical. So let's try to dig down a little bit and like be a little more specific. What are the um, business skills that people should learn? Like what, what sorts of things specifically do you think are, are good um, things when you're starting off and then things when you're a little more advanced? So starting off, I, the first one I would start with because it's, it's borderline unavoidable is um, understanding enough about, I guess, contracts, billing models and finance um, so that you can you know, just actually conduct your business. I mean, that's a little bit of low hanging fruit in terms of this discussion, but it's, I would say the first thing you need to really think about that's different than maybe if uh, you've never freelanced before. Yeah, I agree. And then kind of taking those uh, to the next level, uh, it's important to understand just kind of 
the fundamentals of business, not only for your own business, but businesses that you work with. Uh, you know, it helps to understand how your client or prospect makes their money so that you can advise on ways that they could do that better. And so that mm. you can justify your cost and be able to say, you know, hey, yeah, this is going to be expensive to do, but look at these ways that it will improve your business and look at the the tangible outcomes that we can expect from this. And having a, a good grounded base in just business fundamentals gives you a really good platform to be able to get to those why questions uh, that, you know, Jonathan Stark has talked about a lot on this show. You know, it's very important to understand why your customer or prospect wants to do the thing that they want to do and why they want to do it now instead of six months ago or six months from now. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to just understanding business fundamentals and understanding how cash flows through a business uh, and how they can justify expenses that will lead to revenues down the road. Yeah. It's always good to understand why somebody wants to give you money and why it's worth it. Or, you know, in some cases, if it's not, absolutely, that's a good call. Yeah. I mean, you want to understand who your clients are. I, I mean, like for so long, again, when I was starting off and it worked sort of day to day, but people come to me with different needs, di totally different things. And I was loving it because it was sort of all over the map and I was learning new stuff and drinking it up. But if I had sat down and thought a little more about how is this strategically going to help me? How is this client going to help me get to another client, help me get to another client? Um, and so thinking about those whys, why questions, thinking about the direction I was going in, thinking about strategically and not just, okay, another person wants to give me money. That's fantastic. Um, a little more strategy and, and thinking would, would be smart. Um, you, you mentioned, I think it was Eric mentioned, like uh, um, also thinking about contracts a bit. Learning about those, I would say, learning about just some of the legalities of how does a company work, right? Like, I mean, and, and I realize different countries have different ways of doing things. Um, I mean, I actually have a fully incorporated company here in Israel, which means that there's me, Reuven, the person, and then there's my company. And these are separate entities legally, and they have separate bank accounts and separate ID numbers with the government and separate tax reporting necessities. And so... It took me a long time, I would even argue, I'm still learning how that works and what the differences are, both for good and for bad. For bad in terms of, oh my God, it's all this extra overhead um, and I have to get used to buying things in a certain way. The good part is that if I'm buying things as a business or I'm buying things for the business, then I can actually use it as an expense. And so I have two credit cards, one for me and one for my company. And it's always a matter of, well, you know, which, which one is appropriate and learning to just sort of think in those terms, is this a me expense, is this a company expense, can really help you down the line. Yeah. From a career development perspective, too, you're, you know, in a very real way, learning the skills of being a CEO. Um, I think about this, too, as I have a business um, that's growing and has employees and such now, you kind of start out where you learn enough about that stuff, maybe to do some of it, and then to figure out when you need to call in an expert. And that starts to lay this natural path to um, you know, maybe at first that's a bookkeeper and somebody that's prepping your taxes, and then you're hiring somebody to do the books more and more on a full-time basis. And eventually, um, if your company were to get big enough, that would be a CFO or someone reporting to you. So you learn this skill of learning enough about the things related to your business to understand whether you should delegate them, you know, to a consultant or maybe an employee or what have you. Um, that's an important set of skills if you're going to be off on your own side. So you know, in a very real way, anybody who's a freelancer ought to think of career development in terms of learning the skills of being the CEO, even if you're just the CEO of this, um, you know, entity that you've created, you know, your business. Hey, folks, let me tell you about a really cool thing. It's the dot .tech domains. Listen, you work in tech. I work in tech. We all do things that affect technology. So why not have it reflected in our domain names? If you head over to get.tech or head over to your favorite domain registrar, you can pick up a dot .tech domain right now. In fact, if you want to get show notes for this show, you can check them out at freelancershow.tech. Yeah, you, you want to talk to some some experts. I mean, just, just earlier today, I was talking to my accountant about how I'm probably setting up a, uh, an entity in China and setting up an entity in the US. And I, 
I, and he started saying to me, yes, and it's very important that we structure in this way and this way and this way. So that if you're losing money in one company and you're making money in another company, then we can transfer in different ways. And you want to make sure you have the expenses around the right place. And I said, okay, it sounds like if this really goes through for the next six to eight months, I'm going to be calling you before I have any expenses to ask what's appropriate. He said, right, you are going to want to do that. And knowing that I have this expert at my uh, beck and call to answer these questions is crucial and, and, and knowing that I should not make decisions on my own is really important. Yeah. I fully Heaven help me. <laughs> <laughs> so So where, where can you go to learn these things? Like, I mean, I mean, I talk to my accountant. I talk when I have, I have to, a legal problem. I talk to a lawyer. But are there any, like, formal, are there any good books, courses, videos, blogs, something that people can go to to sort of brush up on this stuff? Uh, I think The Personal MBA by Josh Kaufman is a great book just for business fundamentals. Uh, it covers, as best I can tell, I, I mean, I, I disclaim this by saying I do not have an economics degree or anything even close to it, but it seems like it covers, you know, much of what's ta taught in early level business classes. Um, and it just covers, you know, most of the main concepts of how business work, what they need to do. Uh, all that kind of stuff. It's a great uh, reference manual and a good thing to just kind of read through to get a feel for how do businesses work? What do they do? How do they make money? Uh, all that kind of stuff. That's one of my favorites. I wish I had a list of books or resources. The, the thing I've relied on uh, intensely over the years is uh, networks of people who are also in the same boat. Um, I don't even know how many years ago it was now. I, I got into a mastermind group um, and I've been in, you know, various discussion groups and just kind of known people through contacts. And so I guess what I would say is my single biggest helping factor has been other people, even if they're just feeling through it the way I am, because they can give you some recommendations and help you triangulate a little. So that's probably not the most satisfying. Like I wish I, I had a war chest of resources to go to, but I cannot overstate the importance of having people that you're in communication with that are in a similar boat to you. I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, and not being afraid to ask questions of those people. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's sometimes a hard thing to get over. You kind of feel like you're supposed to know how everything works and have all the answers and it can sometimes feel embarrassing to ask questions. Um, and you really need to find a group of people where that's not the case and that, you know, they're going to be supportive and will help find answers if they don't have answers. Um, and a lot of times, you know, it just is really, really helpful to have a, I guess what you can think of as a uninterested third party opinion, sort of like somebody that's not deep in your own weeds that can help you evaluate a situation and kind of see it without all the emotional baggage that you're invariably going to bring to it. Absolutely. The, the number of times that I've turned to Slack channels with other freelancers that I'm on um, and gotten fantastic advice because people aren't so steeped in what I'm doing. So like to partly answer my question from before and partly respond to what you're saying, I, I also I, I wish I had some great advice for where people can go to learn this stuff. Um, and there's nothing obvious to me, but I've learned a ton, a ton, a ton from other freelancers and just from not being embarrassed to ask questions. Because, I mean, I've been freelancing for a long time. People are always, always like, oh, well, you know, you, you've done it for so long, so you must know what's going on. No, no, I'm just making different mistakes than I did early on. Um, <laughs> and, and, big, and usually bigger ones. <laughs> it's like, That's the truth. It's like there's there. this expression, you know, li little kids, little problems, big kids, big problems. It's sort of the same for, for consulting. And so the ability to go to people and say, hey, I'm thinking of starting doing X and Y and Z. What do you think? Usually someone else has more experience in doing X or Y or Z and can help you out. So, so that's like, that's been my main way of, uh, of, of learning these things. Yeah. I wonder if it's just too, um, varied, you know, for there to be sort of a canonical resource of, all right, you want to freelance, here's all the stuff you've got to do. I wonder if it like varies too much by domain and, and it shifts over the course of time that, you know, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I wonder, like, could you even put together something definitive like that? Or would it be too varied? Like, it might need to be some video library or something. Look, I know that Kai and 
uh, Jonathan and Philip and a bunch of others put together this. Oh, I wish I could remember exactly what it's called. Like the uh, consulting, consulting manual. Yeah. Mm. Are you in that, Jeremy? I can't remember. Yep. Oh, yep. sorry about that. Was a contributor. <laughs> hey, no worries. <laughs> um, so that had a lot of great sort of advice for the people in our kind of niche or niches, which is like, you know, people doing consulting online software slash design slash SaaS kind of stuff, maybe slash content. Um, but all of it, even though the advice is great, it's still kind of general. It's like to get you thinking, it's, it's to give you the right elements in your thoughts, but it's not a solution. It's so that you can start at least thinking in the right direction, have the right vocabulary to ask the right questions, which is in and of itself important, I must admit. Yeah. And I think that speaks a lot to, you know, freelancers and consultants um, are kind of each unique snowflakes. You know, there's, I think there's not really a, a stamper that you can use to just stamp out a, a new freelance business. You know, it really depends on the goals and the skills and the, you know, desires and go get itness of the operator. Uh, and when you're working by yourself, you know, it's all on you. And so it is very, very tailored to what you want it to be and how you want it to work. Right. Right. I mean, freelance is such a wide open. I mean, it's like by definition, very open. it's even more like if you were saying to someone, I have a restaurant, right? Like there's so many different kinds of restaurants and freelance <laughs> is even like mm -hmm. more varied than that. So it's not going to yeah. be one size fits all. Um, yeah. By the way, if you have a restaurant, power to you. That seems like such a hard business to succeed in. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. What do you guys think about uh, masterminds and, and groups like that to, to get feedback and career development? I'm for them. I've, um, I've been part of a mastermind for a number of years, as I mentioned. And to me, I think it's a great move. I would definitely advocate, especially for anyone just getting started, if you can find something like that to participate in, you probably want to look for people in a relatively similar position as you. I mean, if you're just starting out as a freelancer and you're in a mastermind with somebody who has you know, a seven-figure business, that might be somewhat of a mismatch. So you probably want to look for people in similar straits. They don't necessarily need to be in the same domain exactly. Like some variety there is good. Um, yeah. And what I've found that I love so much about it is kind of twofold because uh, it supplies a couple of things that maybe you would lack in um, coming from the corporate world where this is enforced upon you to being on your own. And it's the accountability associated with it. So you're showing up every week and at least in the form of the mastermind I'm in, um, you're kind of saying, here are the things, you know, the big things that I'm looking to do over the next week or two or whatever the interval is. And so there's this kind of commitment device going on. And then there's the guidance where you're kind of taking turns and saying, hey, you know, what do you folks think I should be doing? How do you think I'm, you know, doing with this? Uh, so you're getting two things that you don't get on your own, uh, the accountability and the sort of evaluation uh, of how you're doing. So that's a very long way of saying I wholeheartedly support the concept. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and I, I think I would even be a little more strident in what Eric just mentioned about you want to have some variety in your mastermind and you don't want everybody to be in the same domain. It's maybe even worth considering that you don't want really any or certainly very many people that are in the same domain uh, because mm -hmm. you, do, you really want it to be a, a space where people are open to talking about everything. And if you feel like you're competing directly with people that are in your mastermind, I feel like that could set up some weird dynamics where people are trying to, you know, protect what they view as their secret sauce or whatever. Um, Good point. Yeah. And you really want it to be something where, you know, these are going to be peers that hopefully are going to help you with your business for years. And you want them to be become very intimately involved in not involved, but uh, aware of how your business works and kind of what your struggles are. Uh, and it can be hard to do that if you feel like you're competing with people that are in that group. That is a great point. Um, because I think for it to be successful, you're going to be sharing, you know, maybe financial information, things mm -hmm. that are kind of private that you wouldn't 
share with other people because you're not going to get as good feedback if you're not doing that. So yeah, you wouldn't want to be sharing sort of your financials and secret sauce strategy with competitors. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you're looking for peers that are in a same spot in their business, but not doing the same business, if that makes any sense. I think that is a very, very good piece of advice. I mean, I have uh, uh, like a few peers who do Python training. And on the one hand, it's a huge world out there. And like, come on, we, we like, like the, to say that we're going to be competing directly is kind of weird. On the other hand, it does feel a little bit funny to talk to them about this sort of direct thing when we might potentially occasionally um, like, you know, compete with each other or at least be in the same space or step on each other's toes. Whereas I have a, a friend and colleague who used to be in a mastermind with me. I was the one who left, not him, um, who does Ember training. And so there it's like, great, we can share ideas. And, and I know someone else who does our training and we can totally be open and share about stuff because there's no way that we'll even come close to colliding. Yeah. Like to, to run with that example a little bit, you know, if you're in a mastermind group with another Python trainer and you are dealing with a client that, you know, maybe is pushing back on a rate or something, you know, are you going to be hesitant to divulge all of that information to the group if you know that there's a chance that somebody in there is going to be able to put two and two together and go, oh, hey, here's a, a company that wants Python training. They don't want to pay Ruben's rates. Maybe I can sweep in there and undercut him. Yeah, boy, the nerve. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying any of the people in your group would do that, but you can, even if you're confident that they wouldn't, that's still going to be kind of a thing kind of nagging at the back of your mind that is going to be pushing you towards, oh, maybe don't, maybe don't divulge everything to the group because there is a risk. Uh, and you really want to try to get those risks out of the way so that, you know, you can give the people that are trying to help you all of the information that they need to be able to help you. And I think of the mastermind as kind of like um, you and the people in it are serving as, so if you're the CEO of a company of one, the mastermind is kind of like you picking a board of directors and, and you all serve that role for each other. And if you're the CEO, that's kind of the only person that's doing your career development is the board of directors. So it's kind of a natural fit. Yep. So what about, um, I mentioned a little bit earlier, like marketing, like lately I've started learning a bit more about Facebook marketing, I've been learning a little more about like analytics. I've been learning like how, how to, I, I just like earlier today, finally merged my blog and my main website into the same thing, which I've been talking about for a year, right? These, these things take, take time, but they take some understanding of what the implications are going to be and how to do them. So where, where, where do you learn the non, I mean, maybe I guess it's partly technical in terms of the implementation, but where do you learn about this stuff and, and what's worth learning for that matter? I've spent a ton of money and made a ton of mistakes in terms of online advertising, right? So how did I do Facebook advertising? I did, I did what everyone does, which is try some things. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. I wasn't exactly sure uh, why and how. I've gotten better at it. And uh, uh, Moitza, I want to say Mars, but I think her last name is something different now that she got married. And it's not so now. It's like a while ago. Anyway, so like... She, Jove, I think it's, it is. Anyway, yeah. so Mo Moitza has, has a, a, like a course about Facebook advertising. I've gone part of the way through and I've learned something from, and from her book. And so I've discovered sort of what mistakes I, some of the major mistakes I should not make. Um, but then I've been trying some LinkedIn ads recently and that's a totally different way to do things. Not to mention Google ads and so forth. And that's just like advertising. There's also the marketing, like the, the how to write a sales page, how to write a landing page, how to write an email sequence. There's just so much to do on this front. And I feel like slowly but surely I'm learning how to do it a little bit from here and a little bit from there. Hey, folks, I found a terrific tool for planning out your projects and setting timelines. It's actually terrific. If you've ever used a Gantt chart before, it's based on that but it's got a whole lot of other great features. It's an interactive online project management tool for people who love planning with timelines and Gantt charts. The thing that I like about it is that I can actually plan things out and I can get a tentative timeline for what's going on. And then it's got a simple UI with drag and drop capabilities that make it really easy for me to adjust the timeline and it'll automatically adjust everything else based on what is dependent on what is dependent on what. And it's just, it's terrific. Um, so the, the online process and learning curve are really, really short. 
It's a terrific fit for both individual freelancers and for teams. Project coordinators love the simple planning and other great features like workload, task assignments, deadlines, critical path, uh, baseline. Uh, teams use it for online co uh, collaboration. To the, you can leave comments, you can attach files, you can send notifications, the whole nine yards. Um, it integrates with Jira if you're using Jira. But the other killer feature for me was that you can actually switch it over and you can see it in a Kanban board view, which is awesome. You can get a 14-day trial at gantpro.com. You can also use their software development project template if that's what you're into. And that's at gantpro.com slash software dash development dash plan dash template. And if you use the code devchat, you can get $50 off for using Gantt Pro. So go check it out at gantpro.com. Hmm. Uh, I'm, the thing I'm struggling with here since for the last couple of years I've run a marketing agency is like trying to get away from the curse of knowledge. Um, and think about the advice I'd offer people who are kind of getting started with their marketing. And I think maybe it would be, I mean, this is a little general, but it's uh, pick a medium or maybe two and start to like produce content there and try to generate buzz about it. Cause I think the thing that you probably the easiest mistake to make early on with marketing, especially if you have limited resources or availability for it is to go out and look at say all the social media and say, I want to show up in all these places. So, all right, let me, you know, build a roster of what I'm going to do on LinkedIn and on Twitter and, you know, on and on and on. I think the main thing is to pick a pretty narrow set of that and start to get good at it, to keep showing up, to build an audience, to help people most importantly, and then to sort of see what's working and what isn't and tune and measure as you go. So I don't know that that's super specific. I guess the specific part about it is try to err on the side of not doing too many things at once. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I also think um, it can be tempting to look at uh, what what other entities are doing in terms of marketing and advertising and feel like you need to match that even if those entities don't really match what your business is or what you want it to be. Uh, and by that, I mean that, you know, the way that Slack or Stripe or somebody like that does advertising and marketing they have different goals for that advertising and marketing than you do as a solo operator of a consulting business. And, you know, they are going for rep they're, they're working on the repetition breeds famili familiarity uh, thing where they need to get their message in front of people a lot of times and then are trying to convert relatively low value deals. Uh, yeah. Whereas as a consultant, you, you really only probably need to close, you know, a handful of deals in a year to keep your pipeline full. And so you don't need that barrage of marketing and advertising. You need to be more targeted. And, you know, really, I think a lot of freelancers can probably start with not even trying to really do what you traditionally think of as marketing and advertising, but more just finding where your customers are, go talk to them learn about what their problems are and then, you know, write about a solution to those problems and kind of do the more traditional content marketing thing. Uh, but, but very, very specifically, you know, you're not trying to cast a wide net that is going to catch the eye of a whole lot of people. You're, you're doing, you know, spear fishing where you're trying to go after real big fish that have very specific problems and you want to write stuff that lets people know very early that, oh yeah, that's me. I have that problem or now nah, none of this applies to me. I, I None of this matters. I, I absolutely love the point about not copying kind of by rote what companies different than yours or, or people different than you are doing. Because one of the biggest pieces of advice or one of the, I'll say the biggest mistakes that I see when consulting with uh, dev tools companies that are maybe looking to start a blog or trying to figure out what to post there is they go around and they look at, you know, this is what Microsoft is doing, or this is what GitHub is doing. And I wind up having these conversations like, well, you're not Microsoft or GitHub. Uh, you don't have the same problems they face and you're not trying to accomplish the same things with their blog. So that is a very easy thing to do because those are successful organizations. So you say, oh, I, you know, I, I like their marketing. It's snazzy. I like what they're doing. Um, so let me go try to emulate that. You don't want to do that. Um, to echo Jeremy's point there, you want to um, 
see who is doing a similar thing to you and having success with. And if you're going to emulate anything, that's what it's going to be. But yeah, show up where your buyers are, um, help them, and then kind of build around uh, the content that you're creating and that marketing, you know, tune that as you go to make it more successful. Right. It's, it's, I, I had I, a lot, a lot of the learning and improving is in the tuning, right? We might say, okay, you know, tune it. But like, that's what you're going to spend years doing, taking a look at it and analyzing it. And so I found it, for example, like, you know, trying to build up my online training business. I've been looking at how other people sell courses and how they pitch them and how they talk to their lists. And, and that's way more relevant to what I've been sort of doing in terms of marketing than, say, a SaaS or a fully automated thing. And I mean, I, I think I might have told this story before, but like Rob Walling, when he started Drip, would talk about how he was onboarding people manually. And that's how he learned how to automate things. I remember thinking at the time, that's nuts. <laughs> like he should just automate it. And I see now how brilliant that was. And um, I mean, with, with some of my exercise courses, so basically I've been slowly but surely automating things and I've been seeing where the problems are and people have been able to get back to me and people talk to me directly. And it's good that it's sort of still at a low to medium level because I'm expecting if the trends continue, it's going to explode in size in the next year or two. And by then I'll sort of know where the holes are and how to automate it. But if I didn't go through that learning process uh, manually, I would never have any idea. So learning from someone who's done something sort of similar to me is, is good, although I'm, I'm no drip, that's for sure. So I think that this is actually making me think this idea of like specific tuning is making me think of something that is, if you're going to take your career development into your own hands as compared to the corporate world, um, that you need to, uh, a skill that's going to transcend kind of everything you do, whether it's marketing or sales or finance or what have you, um, is getting good at identifying what you actually want to achieve and then laying out metrics by which you're going to measure yourself. And like maybe a great concrete example of this is if you go off on your own and you start a blog to kind of go along with your freelance business, um, it might occur to you to measure the blog by traffic or by social shares. But at the end of the day, that's not probably the best metric. It's a proxy metric maybe. Like what you really want to be measuring if you're closing typically six figure deals is uh, how many uh, prospect calls do you get or how many inbound qualified leads do you get? And then how many of those convert? So figuring out the, the way that you're going to measure progress with your business is critically important because you're not going to have anyone to do it for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, right. Now, what, what about um, technical skills? Right. If you're a technical sort of consultant, whether it's in design or programming or networks or DevOps or all that other stuff, how much do you need to improve your skills and how do you improve them? Hmm. I'm trying to think of a catch all answer because it feels to me like it could kind of depend. I mean, once you are freelancing, you're kind of showing up and giving your buyers what they need. So depending on the nature of the buyer, um, it seems like in some cases you might not need to do as much sharpening of the saw as others. So I'm trying to think of some good heuristics and nothing's coming to mind off the top. Um, I think that it is critically important to do that sharpening to whatever extent it, you know, sustains your competitive advantage. Uh, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you definitely need to do it. Um, one of my favorite methods is uh, just going to conferences and, you know, paying attention to the talks, watch what people are talking about. Uh, that can really give you a pretty good view into where things are headed and what sorts of things you should maybe go home and read up on after the conference is over. And it's a great way to meet other people that are doing what you're doing, you know, develop a peer network. Uh, and that's, a, and you know, that's really a very important part of, um, uh, running a business, I think, is having a network of people that know and understand what you do and, you know, can be in a position to recommend you if something comes across their path that you would be a good fit for. You know, that just reminded me of maybe 
a heuristic I'd offer, which is like showing up at conferences, you, you need to keep your finger on the pulse of what's coming out, what is the latest and greatest. And I think maybe you need to be keeping your finger on the pulse of it just enough to have a good recognition of, oh, that's a thing I really need to learn. That's going to help my buyers. That's going to keep me competitive. And then to have sort of the judiciousness to say, these other frameworks coming out, not so much. I don't think this is super important, but this one I need to know. So maybe that's the heuristic I'd offer that, you know, as Jeremy was saying, by, by showing up at conferences or whatever it is you're doing to at least be aware of what's out there and what it means. Yeah, I mean, I um, I often use my my courses as a way of doing that to some degree where, you know, the expression where a, a leader is someone who sees which way the crowd is running and runs in front of them. So I feel like I often am doing that. I'm like, hmm, everyone's asking me questions about X. I should probably learn more about X. And then I learned more about X and it's like, well, what do you know? Everyone else is, you know, the, the people who asked me those questions were giving me hints as to which direction to go in. And conferences are probably a way smarter way to do that because you'll see it even a little earlier than what sort of the, the, the general uh, population wants. Um, and yeah, if you can sort of see those trends and learn a bit about it. And so if I see that, like I did this with data science, where people started asking me, I guess it was five years ago, data science type questions. So I started learning, I mean, particularly in Python, it's like NumPy and Pandas and that sort of thing. And sure enough, nowadays, everyone wants to learn it. And that's one of my most popular courses. And I know that it took like years for me to build up the knowledge that I would be able to provide it. But now I'm that sort of far ahead of the curve. And it's only thanks to sort of paying attention to what people wanted. Um, by the way, like, how did I learn this stuff? I spent a lot of time looking through blogs and books and videos, and I even took a few online courses from other people and little by little assembled that information. And you can get some cheap courses on Udemy that might give you sort of an initial direction. I mean, there's, the, the problem nowadays is not finding information about technology. It's like finding the time to learn it and finding out which um, sort of which courses, which resources, which blogs and books are, are the best. Yeah, and I think part of, uh, you know, whittling down of which of those myriad resources you should pay attention to, it's important to keep in mind the difference between what it is that you do and what it is that you deliver for your clients. Um, and just to illustrate that, I, you know, there are a number of ways that you might be able to go to an e-commerce shop and say, hey we can improve your conversion rate by 2%. You know, it might be that your specialty is, uh, you know, performance enhancement for web frameworks. And so, you know, there's plenty of studies that show that for every few milliseconds you can take off of page load times on e-commerce shops, that's going to boost revenue. Uh, you might be a copywriting expert that knows how to run a B testing tools. And so you say, Hey, we're going to run some a B tests. And by finding the right copy, we can probably get a 2% lift on your conversions. Um, you know, maybe it is about testing new designs. Uh, you know, maybe it's offering new product photography that makes the products look better. There's a lot of ways that you can deliver that boost in revenue that is not tied up in exactly how you do it and the fact that you're delivering that boost in revenue is what you're delivering and the means that you do it is kind of incidental to the client and so if you keep in mind what it is that you're trying to deliver that can help you uh, keep your eye on which things you should be paying attention to that you want to do in order to be able to deliver that I hope that made sense. I'm not sure that was a, that might have yeah. been kind of a rambling. Uh, <laughs> that makes total sense. And I think the, um, maybe the broader takeaway here is that when it comes to, you know, the amount of technical skill, this is uniquely going to be up to you to figure out. And it's going to be in response to your buyers and what you're delivering. Um, so you're going to have to not only learn how to keep up to date with technical skills and good techniques for doing that, but learn how much of that is a good use of your time versus how much is diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. uh, we're probably getting close to our time. Any other suggestions for what people can and should do to improve their careers? This is a little oblique, but um, 
Something you might think about is, I think most people are going to be pretty happy freelancing and want to stay there. But if you kind of take a look from time to time at like, if I were to sort of wander back into the corporate world, where would I fit in? You know, maybe I left as a software developer, but I could make a pretty good um, case that now I, you know, could be a CTO or a CEO or something like that. I think that's a good way um, to kind of moor yourself against what the broader corporate world is doing and to maybe... um, do some oblique evaluation of what kind of skills you're developing and maybe what kinds you need to. So it's a little abstract, but, um, you know, I do that from time to time. And I think about like, if I were going to take a role again uh, with a company, like, you know, could I do this? And then I kind of work backwards and say, so am I applying, you know, the necessary skills of say being a CEO to this business that I have? Um, So it's, you know, an interesting thought exercise. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I mean, I guess I've been the CEO of my company for, you know, two and a half decades now. And yet, if I were to think about what role would I take in a company, I don't know if I think of CEO, I think it would be more like a CTO, even though, um, yeah, huh. Oh, I'm gonna have to think about this a lot more. Now I won't be able to sleep tonight. Thanks, Eric. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, uh, I think we have covered a lot of stuff here. Um, How about we, uh, we move on to picks for this week? Jeremy, you got anything for us? Uh, I'll just uh, pick uh, The Personal MBA, which I mentioned earlier, a good book about business fundamentals. Uh, It's both good for a read-through to make sure that you kind of understand all the basics, and it's a great thing to have on hand as a reference uh, reference source if you just need to go back and look up something and kind of make sure that you actually know what you think or hope that you know. Uh, And that's all I got this week. All right. Eric, what about you? I will do a pick um, just given the what we were talking about uh, as it related to content marketing. Um, my business hit subscribe. I've started doing some YouTube videos on there for it. And uh, if you are in a position as a freelancer where you're looking to get into content marketing um, and look learn about things like what kind of content should you write and how do you target uh, keywords for organic search and that sort of thing, uh, those are all the sorts of topics that I'm covering in this YouTube channel. So I will throw a link to that. And I believe that is the only thing I can think of off the top. So that's it. So I've got two picks this week. Uh, One is a new course that I came out with a few weeks ago as of this recording, but I guess I forgot to mention it. I think I forgot to mention it, which is all about NumPy. NumPy is the sort of basis for data science in the Python world. Um, I'm coming out with a companion sort of add-on course to that about pandas, which is what I described as the automatic transmission to NumPy's manual transmission. But if you're doing any sort of data science and you're interested in Python, or if you're, just, if you're doing any sort of Python, you're interested in data science, definitely take a look at the uh, course. And the other thing is, um, I've been told for a long time that I should use a CRM, a Customer Relationship Manager software. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. I don't really need that sort of thing. And I was finally convinced to take a look at one and try it. I've been trying Pipedrive. And I must say, in just the week and a half of trying it, I've not only been very impressed by Pipedrive, I am shocked that I wasn't convinced to use one of these things earlier because the number of potential customers and actual customers who have fallen through the cracks, thanks to my memory or lack thereof, is astonishingly high. So um, I definitely, we maybe we should even do an episode about CRMs and using them and techniques for using them because I, I, I'm sure that I'm only scratching the surface of how to use this thing and I've already been very, very impressed. So I'll, I'll put a link to that in the, in the show notes as well. Uh, And I guess that's it for this week. So thanks to uh, Jeremy and Eric for joining us on the panel. And thanks to all of you out there for listening. And we'll be back next week on The Freelancer Show. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.